So uh, welcome to the ASO webinar. We're going to get started in about five minutes here with um, Dr. Ethan Russo, who's presenting on the topic of cannabis as an unconventional solution to the opioid epidemic. Um, and uh, Americans for Safe Access is a medical cannabis patient advocacy group. Uh, which focuses on medical cannabis patients and ensuring access to medical cannabis for therapeutic and research purposes. Um, we've been leading, organizing, and advocating for safe access to medical cannabis for over a decade, and we're continuing to expand access and expand research with a series of critically important studies and efforts. And so for all of you who are supporting this webinar and members of ASA, we want to thank you uh, for your continued support. Um, so, uh, ASA is a grassroots base of over 100,000 members, and we have professional advisory groups to affect change through public education, development, research, and direct advocacy. Um, so we engage in, you know, direct action, impact litigation, rallies, protests, direct actions, policies, helping to pass local, state, and federal legislation, engaging in research, data gathering, reports, and studies, as well as developing consumer safety and other regulatory support stuff. We also have a ton of educational material, which we will briefly mention at the end of the webinar if you're interested in, in finding more good information. Uh, so when we talk about safe and legal access to medical cannabis, uh, we're talking about international, federal, and state laws and regulations that recognize cannabis as a legal medicine. We recognize the ability of medical professionals uh, to recommend cannabis as a frontline option or an adjunct therapy. Uh, patients and their caregivers uh, have the information they need to make educated choices about medical cannabis therapies. Patients and medical professionals can incorporate a divorce group of products and delivery methods to create required personalized treatment regime. And we also want to make sure that patients can trust the labels and products and that their medicines are free of harmful levels of pesticides and other contaminants. And we would ultimately like to see medical cannabis treatments covered by insurance. Um, and so, you know, to summarize, our goals at ASA are to resolve the federal and state conflict on medical cannabis ensure safe and legal access to medical cannabis patients nationwide, end stigma and discrimination, regulate cannabis like an herbal medicine, and make it available as a frontline treatment option. And so that brings us uh, to our topic today. And as many of you know, there um, is a bit of an issue with opioids in the US, and I'm going to Leave that to our speaker to talk about that. But for those of you who are not familiar with Dr. Ethan Russo's work, he's a board certified neurologist, uh, psychopharmacology researcher, and the medical director of Phytex. He has spent uh, over a decade as a senior medical advisor involved with numerous studies at GW Pharmaceuticals for phase one through three trials of Sativex, which is a nabiximol. Uh, an oral mucosal spray of cannabis that's been standardized and tested in numerous clinical trials, as well as studies of Epidiolex, the purified CBD extract. His education was based largely on the East Coast, graduating from UPenn, as well as attending the medical school at the University of Massachusetts. Um, he has been a clinical neurologist in Missoula, Montana for 20 years. He's held various faculty appointments at the University of Montana and in medicine at the University of Washington. He has been involved in scientific societies. He is a longtime member and former president of the International Cannabinoid Research Society and former chairman of the International Association for Cannabinoids as Medicine. He is an author, editor of seven books on cannabis and medicinal herbs and has published numerous book chapters, um, over 50 articles and variety of topics. Um, and these are just some of them. If you're watching the cameras, uh, I have a well-loved copy of Cannabis and Cannabinoids, great book. Um, but he's also an author of the American Herbal Pharmacopeia, and uh, has we recently authored a book chapter in a textbook that has just come out called Cannabinoid Pharmacology. The title of that brand new article is Cannabis Pharmacology, The Usual Suspects, 
and a few promising leads. And without much more ado, um, it is my pleasure to welcome Ethan Russo to take the webinar stage. Are you there, Ethan? Yes, I am. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Okay, I'm trying to there. Now, I hope that's full screen for everyone and that you can see it. Uh, good evening to most of you. Good afternoon to my fellow West Coasters. Our topic today is cannabis, an unconventional solution to the opioid epidemic. And so we're going to be talking about uh, either the plants themselves or the derivatives of two plants. Of course, cannabis sativa, cultivated cannabis, and papa verisomniferum, otherwise known as the opium poppy. And a lot of their attributes are due to their uh, primary ingredients, or the best recognized THC for cannabis and morphine and other opioids for the opium poppy. First, let's start out with some facts and figures about the current opioid epidemic. Um, some very recent information uh, taken from the New York Times indicated that there were more than 64,000 overdose deaths due to opioids just in the last year. Most of that increase was fueled by use of fentanyl, a synthetic opioid that's about 100 times more potent than morphine. The deaths due to fentanyl increased 540% just in the last three years. Uh, it's estimated in a current editorial uh, by Yasmin Hurd that two and a half million Americans have an opioid use disorder. And we know that 80 people die each day just in this country from overdoses. Unfortunately, 80% of them start by misusing prescription opioids. And those prescriptions are still being written at an amazing clip, 200 million opioid prescriptions per year. <clears throat> That's uh, one for every two out of three Americans. Now, a little historical information. Um, people often think that uh, problems with opioids are a new difficulty, but they're not. Um, it was, uh, morphine was isolated uh, from the opium poppy about 1806. Um, and uh, cannabis really burst onto the scene in the 19th century as a medical agent when uh, O'Shaughnessy brought can cannabis from the East uh, to Europe and then uh, to the States. But we have this selection from uh, Clendenning in England in 1843. He uh, was one of the first to treat migraine with cannabis, um, at least in the West, um, and noted uh, that there was improvement in one of the patients who had morphine withdrawal symptoms that were reduced by the cannabis administration. In the American Civil War, cannabis was employed uh, to treat war injuries, and it was also combined with opium uh, to treat dysentery, a severe form of diarrhea. Uh, so this is an example of using the two together, as was already being done in Europe. Sir so John Russell Reynolds was the personal physician of Queen Victoria, and he wrote extensively over the course of 40 years of the medical uses of cannabis. Um, but in this selection, <clears throat> in 1868, he pointed out the problems with opioids as medicine, which were apparent uh, to many physicians at that time that it was sedating, um, that uh, it could lead to subsequent problems, including dependency, uh, which he did not see with use of Indian hemp, which was the name that they commonly applied uh, to cannabis from the East at that time. Silas Weir Mitchell was an early neurologist in the States, um, and he's talking of treating migraine again. Uh, but noted that on uh, severe cases that a combination of cannabis with uh, morphine um, uh, was helpful, uh, but uh, it was best to avoid the narcotics, meaning the opium-based medicines entirely, because they were more causative of problems than cannabis was. Edouard Seguin was another uh, originally French, then American neurologist, uh, again, um, we have a recurring theme here, uh, 
migraine was one of the most common indications for cannabis. Um, and uh, again, we've got a situation in the bolded type. I never allow my patients to take opium or morphia themselves in, in this disease, um, basically indicating that chronic use of uh, cannabis was able to substantially reduce um, the attack rate in uh, migraine of a chronic nature. Hobart Hare was another prominent uh, physician in Philadelphia in the 19th century. Uh, again, uh, noting the problems with opium, causing people to be prostrate, basically on their backs, on producing nausea, and also being quite sleep-inducing, soporific. Um, but he indicated that sometimes you don't want to sleep, but you want your pain removed, and that's the place where cannabis uh, can be uh, quite an advantage. It aids sleep without forcing sleep uh, and uh, has many less side effects overall, uh, but could be equally as powerful as morphine as a pain-killing drug. Richard Green uh, in England uh, similarly was uh, using uh, both agents. Um, but uh, noted lasting relief only with uh, use of cannabis. So William Gowers was another father of neurology, um, and he indicated that in headaches, actually, uh, opioids were often counterproductive, producing more harm than good, as he t stated it. Um, and particularly one of the effects, another side effect, uh, constipation, uh, whereas Indian hemp lessened the pain um, and uh, was helpful in other neuralgic, nerve-based types of pain. Then J.B. Madison uh, was a specialist in addictions. Um, he employed cannabis in treating addiction to a variety of substances, including cocaine, chloral hydrate, and opiates, on, and made this statement. In these, often it has proved an efficient substitute for the poppy. So we have an early indication of an opioid sparing effect and the ability of cannabis to reduce symptoms of withdrawal. Uh, again, in treating headache on a chronic basis, he noted that hemp eases the pain without disturbing stomach and secretion so often as opium, and that competent men think it not only calmative, but curative. The idea that with regular usage, it could seemingly totally uh, suppress and put the patient in a remission from chronic headaches. Now, this one's really interesting. This was an early uh, 20th century textbook on morphinism and narcomanias, what we would currently call addiction uh, to other drugs. This, he made the statement, cannabis indica can often be used with very good effect in treating morphinism or opioid addiction especially for the temporary removal of the worst symptoms. And I can tell you that I have a copy of this book, and the only mention of cannabis in it is not as a drug of abuse, but rather uh, as an agent uh, to treat addiction to other substances. Here uh, we have an example uh, about a century ago of uh, medicine that was made by Park Davis, a uh, name uh, that's familiar today uh, as a modern pharmaceutical company. Um, and if you look carefully at the label, you'll see that it contains morphine, cannabis, um, oil of peppermint, and tincture of capsicum, chili peppers. So what we've got here is an agent that contains three natural substances that are all analgesics. One is a, a phytoopioid, the, the morphine, phytocannabinoid, uh, the uh, THC, and possibly other cannabinoids, and a phytovanilloid, capsaicin from the chili peppers. These affect the three known endogenous biochemical systems that mediate pain, the endorphins and enkephalins, the endocannabinoids and the vanilloids. And I recognize that that may be a little technical uh, for some of the audience, but um, we certainly can provide uh, background information on pain treatment that will explain this better. What's interesting is that this preparation might have provided better uh, pain relief to an outpatient than we have in the 21st century because we rarely think 
in terms of combining these multiple natural agents to treat pain. Another historical document, this is from um, the LaGuardia Commission. After cannabis was outlawed in uh, 1937, Mayor LaGuardia in New York still was interested in the so-called marijuana problem. And they actually tested uh, an extract of cannabis on addicts who were uh, incarcerated and found uh, that they had much less severe withdrawal symptoms and were able to leave the hospital in much better condition than those who did not. So this is an example of an early randomized controlled trial. Oh, I don't know how randomized it was, but they certainly had a comparison group. Solomon Snyder um, is a, a famous uh, psychopharmacologist. He was the discoverer of the endorphins and encephalons. Uh, in 1971, he wrote a little book on medical uses of cannabis and noted even at that time that in headaches or menstrual cramps uh, where aspirin doesn't provide relief and opioids are too powerful, cannabis might uh, fill the bill. Um, some of the audience may be aware of the work of Todd Micaria, a physician who treated thousands of um, patients with cannabis for a variety of conditions um, in the Bay Area. In 1973, he published a historical compendium of articles from the 19th century, some of which we cited here, and was very interested throughout his career in the ability of cannabis to treat addiction in its various forms. An early study uh, from 1975 in Iowa compared THC to codeine, and we see uh, at the top that 20 milligrams of THC was equi-analgesic, gave the same pain-killing uh, properties as uh, 120 milligrams of codeine, and actually had fewer side effects. More modern information uh, from uh, Ryman, um, she did her PhD on cannabis as a substitute for alcohol and has remained very interested in this as aspect of medicine. Um, and uh, noted that patients who use cannabis in a harm reduction paradigm, in other words, uh, with other medicines, 40% um, indicated that they substituted for alcohol, 26 substituted cannabis for illicit drugs, and 66% substituted for prescription drugs. And Amanda is still doing that kind of work. Uh, another person that's uh, heavily involved in this uh, is Philippe Lucas, um, who uh, ran a compassion club in Victoria, British Columbia, and is working on his PhD now. Um, he uh, has written extensively, including this article, again, on cannabis as an adjunct to or substitute for opiates in the treatment of chronic pain. So what is the scientific basis for all this? And now we're gonna get a little bit technical, but uh, hopefully you're aware of the endocannabinoid system. This is the system in our body where endogenous cannabinoids, things that resemble THC in their activity, uh, where it works. Um, this system is active in a tonic fashion and control of pain. That means that there is a baseline level of activity and uh, this system is key to how our nervous systems react to and deal with pain. Uh, we know that there are many cannabinoid receptors in areas of the brain that are nociceptive, the ones that are involved in uh, pain control. Um, one of those areas is the periaqueductal gray matter of the brainstem, uh, where the cannabinoids have integrative control of pain. Another is in the thalamus, the ventral postural lateral nucleus, where cannabinoids are actually 10 times more potent than morphine um, in the type of nerve cells that mediate pain. Additionally, these, um, the endocannabinoid system is very active in the various areas of the spinal cord uh, that mediate pain and also phenomena that are associated with nerve-based pain. 
um, things like allodynia, where a light touch is perceived as burning, and things of this sort. Additionally, the endocannabinoid system works on uh, pain out in the periphery, meaning out in the body, uh, where it has an active role in not only pain, but inflammation, and even things like itch. Again, we need to make distinctions in how cannabinoids work on pain as opposed to opioids. These are systems that often run in parallel, but they do different things. There's some overlap, but there are distinctions as well. We know that both THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, and cannabidiol, CBD, have pain-killing properties and are effective even in animal models. Um, the mechanisms are multiple. It's not only at the two recognized uh, cannabinoid receptors, but a uh, related receptor often considered part of the endocannabinoid system. Uh, that is the TRPV1 receptors where CBD, but not THC, are active. That's also where chili peppers work. CBD has myriad anti-inflammatory properties. Um, we know that opioids work at the mu opioid receptor on pain. Uh, the cannabinoids do not work there, which is good because that's the, the um, receptor that produces the side effect of opioids, particularly respiratory arrest. Um, when doses of an opioid are too high, um, this can cause a person to quit breathing. That's the cause of death uh, with opioids. Um, they're otherwise not to so toxic, but this is an overwhelming uh, problem when somebody takes too much. In contrast, there are almost no cannabinoid receptors in the cardiorespiratory centers in the brainstem, and so there is no dose of a uh, cannabinoid, particularly THC, that can produce respiratory depression. Um, this is the reason that we have no mortality attributable to overdose of cannabis. Um, interestingly, there are no particular drug-drug interactions between the cannabinoids and opioids that can be freely used together, has been demonstrated in numerous uh, clinical trials. Some of the interactions. We know that THC stimulates beta-endorphin production, beta-endorphin being one of the endogenous opioids. Um, it um, also interacts with the opioids in the periaqueductal gray matter, that area uh, that is a migraine generator in the brain stem. Um, a series of studies were done by Diana Sikowitz uh, in the prior decades, um, and she did a lot of work with animals and noted that THC may allow clinical opiate sparing. This is a term you'll hear a lot. Basically, it means that the dose that is necessary to attain pain control in the animal or in a human is considerably lower when THC is present. She also conclusively demonstrated in these animal models that THC prevented development of tolerance to and withdrawal from opiates. With opiates, if someone has a baseline level of pain, eventually they often need to continue to increase the dose to maintain pain control. And uh, that's the time that as the dose goes up, withdrawal symptoms may increase, but both of these phenomena can be blocked with THC administration. Finally, THC is able to rekindle opiate analgesia. This means that if a dose of morphine were given and it wears off in a few hours, on the animal is responding to pain, a tiny dose of THC that alone cannot produce pain control will regenerate effective pain control um, as the opiate is fading. So these are very interesting phenomena that now uh, have shown supportive information in human studies. Um, another uh, animal study I'll, I'll point to particularly is important in relation to cannabidiol. Um, this was administered to rats uh, that were heroin seeking. Um, and um, this behavior could be reduced by administration of CBD 
um, even uh, after a long delay, as much as two weeks later. Uh, additionally, CBD was able to produce changes in the brain uh, in uh, CB1 receptor expression on uh, the nucleus accumbens, which is a generator of addictive behaviors uh, that would be produced by heroin. Um, the results were interesting enough that the authors proposed cannabidiol as a treatment for heroin craving and relapse, and that means in humans. Uh, so that was back in 2009. Another interesting study requires a little bit of explanation. Nakvi et al. were interested in patients who had damage to an area of the brain called the insula. And if I can point, it's this area in here, and the interior of the brain below the uh, temporal lobes. What they noticed was an odd phenomenon. They uh, were used to patients who got injured, who happened to be tobacco smokers, going through withdrawal and needing a cigarette. And when patients had damage in the insula area due to a stroke or head injury, um, they seemingly didn't have their craving for tobacco. And so they felt that the insula seems to be a critical center in the brain that mediated addiction to nicotine, but subsequent work showed that the same is true for cocaine, alcohol, and the opioids. Now, why is that important? Well, as it turns out, um, very high doses of CBD when administered uh, to human uh, volunteers can functionally deactivate the insula, as we see here. Uh, this blue indicates decreased activity on this metabolic scan. Um, interestingly, this large dose did not produce sedation or other uh, overt psychoactive changes uh, that would prevent you from using it. So it may be that rather than having to damage permanently the insula to reduce craving or addiction, that we should be thinking in terms of using cannabidiol in this fashion. Uh, so this seems to be solid evidence for that theoretical approach. Another study, I'll try to tie this together. Again, this is an animal study. Uh, they were looking at the role of the CB2 receptor. So this is a non-psychoactive receptor, usually thought of as acting out in the periphery rather than in the brain. But it is expressed in the brain under conditions of stress, inflammation, or injury. Um, additionally, there is some expression in uh, these areas that are related to the to addiction, including particularly the NAC, the nucleus accumbens. In this uh, test in animals, they used a synthetic agonist, a stimulatory drug for CB2, uh, and uh, this inhibited dopamine release and cocaine self-administration in the mice. Um, another agent in uh, cannabis, um, that is a CB2 agonist without having effects on CB1 like THC is, is beta caryophylline. This is a terpenoid component of almost all types of cannabis, um, but particularly the idea that you could use this mechanism uh, via caryophylline and uh, CBD in addition would give you two points of attack on the addiction problem. But we know historically from the 19th century when they were using what would be THC predominant um, cannabis uh, to treat addiction, that THC works as well. So perhaps all three can be helpful in this pursuit of addiction treatment. Now we're gonna go to some clinical studies. And the Bixamols is the US adopted name for what is otherwise known as Sativex, the trade name for the oromucosal cannabis extract uh, that has about equal amounts of THC and CBD. That drug is approved in 29 countries, but not in the US. There were two phase two clinical trials that were done in cancer pain. These were all patients um, who were considered pretty much terminal um, and had received high doses of opioids, but still did not have effective pain control. Um, and then there was a long-term extension study that we'll talk about too. Um, 
very quickly, uh, the first study, the phase 2A study, was done in a hospice population in Europe. Again, opioid-resistant pain related to cancer. And the primary uh, objective was to look at the numerical rating scale of pain, 0 to 10. 0 is no pain, 10 is the worst pain imaginable. Uh, Nabixamols, um, a number of sprays a day, uh, showed a significant improvement versus placebo uh, in those patients. Um, and looking at the responses over time, uh, at all time points, the nabixamols was significantly superior to the placebo. And so these are patients who maintained their opioid dose. If they had other drugs like antidepressants or anticonvulsants to try and control the pain, they remained on those. This was over and above the best response that they could get previously. Um, there was a big difference in the 30% response rate. So this is the number of patients who had a 30% reduction in their pain from beginning to end. So 43% had that uh, reduction on nabixamols, but less than half that on placebo. And that's highly statistically significant. So let's look at that um, a little more closely. Um, the arrow points to the 30% response rate, and actually there were three agents used in this study. In the gray, you see the placebo. In the uh, light blue, you have um, a high THC extract, but with no cannabidiol. You'll see that those were pretty much the same. They were not different. However, the large, darker blue bar was significantly better uh, than either the high THC extract with no CBD and um, also compared to placebo. The only difference between Sativex, the dark blue, and the Tetranabinex on the light blue was the inclusion of CBD. So this is the first indication of the synergy of CBD and THC in a clinical study in humans. The phase 2b study uh, was a little complicated. There were different dose ranges that were allowed. Uh, but again, the, the population was similar. Uh, patients with advanced cancer, the only real difference was they were treated for five weeks versus two weeks in the prior study. And it was a large uh, set of patients, 360 patients in 15 countries. Um, to make a long story short, uh, there were three dose ranges, as we see here. Um, interestingly, the highest dose range not only had more side effects, THC related, but they didn't do well in the um, response. Um, in other words, uh, their pain control wasn't uh, that good either. Um, this is a good example of, that we run into a lot in cannabis-based medicine that sometimes less is more, meaning that your best results often come with very low or moderate doses, not from high doses. So let's look at those groups. Um, the, the group that was limited to four sprays and the group that was limited to up to 10 sprays. And if we compare them, um, the number of responses, again, at each level of improvement, there's a significant difference between the patients who got placebo with their other drugs versus those that got Sativex. And if we combine the two studies, the 2A and 2B, again, you see a, a good clear demarcation of Sativex versus placebo. And uh, this is just the stats on that, and again, these numbers, these P or probability values are considered very good. Anything that's less than 0 0.05 is considered uh, clinically significant. Now, I want to take a minute and talk about what's called the safety extension study. The 2A study had patients who survived um, and they had the option to uh, remain on Sativex. This is what was called an open label study. So we know that everybody was getting Sativex. 
um, and for as long as they wanted or as long as they survived. Um, so these are patients that were in hospice. They were expected to die from their diseases, but um, Sativex was taken for more than six months by 10% of the patients and more than a year uh, for by 5%. Unfortunately, the reason the numbers weren't higher was because of attrition due to death from the underlying disease. But the important thing is a no dose escalation was needed. With opioids, we expect as a patient has a progressive degenerative disease and is dying of cancer, they're going to need more uh, medicine. Um, not only did the Opioid doses not need to be, uh, I'm sorry, not only did the Sativex dose not increase, but um, the patients didn't increase their opioid doses either. So in summary, the findings showed that some patients will continue to obtain relief of cancer-related pain with long-term use of THC CBD spray, meaning Sativex, without increasing their dose of this or other pain-relieving medications over time. And that's directly a uh, quotation from the article. Uh, this is a remarkable finding. Unfortunately, this kind of information um, isn't really taken in, into account by the Food and Drug Administration when they're evaluating a drug uh, for approval. Um, it's a very striking finding, but because there was no control group, uh, it just doesn't count. Subsequently, there were phase three studies uh, done of cancer pain with Sativex, and it worked in the American patients who weren't as sick as the patients in other countries where, unfortunately, they seem to be too far along in their disease uh, for uh, Sativex to show a significant difference. Um, so uh, this is an approved indication, uh, cancer pain in Canada, but not in the US, unfortunately. A couple of patient examples. Uh, these patients gave me their permission to, uh, to use their pictures and tell their stories. Um, this is an example of a patient with multiple sclerosis who had intractable pain. Um, and although this isn't opioids in this instance, she was on an extremely high dose of amitriptyline, 150 milligrams a day, and was able to reduce it to 25 milligrams a day. Uh, so this is a, a tricyclic antidepressant sparing effect. Uh, and she was able to return to full-time employment advising other uh, patients with multiple sclerosis. A little more pertinent is this example. Uh, this is a Dutch lady who, although uh, she grew up in Holland, uh, had never used cannabis before. Um, she had uh, sciatica, nerve-based pain in the back and leg, um, and was on a, a high dose of MS content, a long-acting morphine, um, and reduced her dose from 180 milligrams a day to 30 milligrams a day while on Sativex, at the same time diminishing her pain from a nine out of 10 down to four out of 10. So a uh, real world example. And there are hundreds of attestations of similar um, uh, types of responses from patients who have used cannabis in other forms. Now, what about the situation? What if uh, a patient who's considering treatment has a cannabis use disorder or an opioid use disorder? What I'm saying here is that cannabis can be used concomitantly with opioids, even in those with medical dependency. Um, that means that if you stopped it, they would have withdrawal. Of course, close follow-up is necessary. Um, at a time when pain reduction is achieved with use of uh, cannabinoids, uh, attempts should be made to reduce the dose by tapering uh, very slowly from the opioids. Um, if you have a patient who fills diagnostic criteria of a cannabis use disorder or high tolerance to high doses, um, there are ways of desensitizing them. Uh, these have been popularized by uh, Dustin Sulak uh, information is available at his website, healer.com. Basically, uh, when patients quit cannabis for a couple of days, 
uh, they often can get the same level of pain control with a much lower dose, obviously reducing not only cost, uh, but side effects as well. Now, we have a little interesting epidemiological data. Uh, this is a study that's received deservedly a lot of attention on 2014 by Bach Huber et al. They looked at states that had medical cannabis laws and what happened with opioid analgesic overdose mortality, the number of patients who died from overdoses of opioids, whether prescription or non-prescription. As you see on the left, the rates of overdose mortality with opioids increased over time, but it was always lower in the states where cannabis was available medically, and then it seemed to plateau. Um, and to just read this on the bolded red, states with med medical cannabis laws had a 24.8% lower overdose mortality, very highly uh, statistically significant. And figures improved annually the longer the policy was in effect. These policies were estimated to have saved 1,729 lives in 2010. And the author said, if the relationship between medical cannabis laws and opioid analgesic overdose mortality is substantiated in further work, enactment of laws to allow for use of medical cannabis may be advocated as part of a comprehensive package of policies to reduce the population risk of opioid analgesics. In the issue of JAMA Internal Medicine, there was an editorial that accompanied this um, where they tried to explain it away, but they really could not. And it has to be uh, added that subsequent information bears this out. This seems to be a real finding and um, with the enormous number of patients dying from opioid uh, analgesic overdose, um, we really need to be thinking more of cannabis as a useful adjunct in this situation and perhaps uh, a solution to the problem. More evidence epidemiologically. This is looking at Medicare Part D. That's the, the part of Medicare where we look at um, prescription drug costs. To quote, National overall reductions in Medicare enrollee spending when states implemented medical marijuana laws were estimated to be $165 million in 2013. Now, if you look carefully in this purple, the biggest reduction in prescriptions was for pain. And a big component of these would be opioids. So again, a totally different demonstration of what happens when cannabis becomes available to patients and changes their use of other drugs, particularly the opioids. Um, I think this may be our last slide. Um, this is a study from Israel. It was an observational study, um, open label, uh, so they knew what people were getting. 176 Israeli chronic pain patients uh, who qualified to be treated uh, with cannabis adjunctively, meaning adding on, uh, and who completed six months of evaluation. Uh, the average intake was about a gram and a half a day, uh, usually by smoking. They used a, a pain symptom score called the S-TOPS, and that reduced from 83 to 75, which is very highly statistically significant. And additionally, there were improvements in other scales, uh, family social disability, role emotional disability, satisfaction with outcome, and sleep uh, problem index. Uh, of the 73 patients on opioids, 44% discontinued them, which again, very highly statistically significant. And the median oral morphine equivalent dose decreased um, substantially, 25% uh, from 60 to 45 milligrams. And uh, you see the graphic representation here. So I believe that's the end of the slideshow. And I am going to try to escape this. Um, I'll stop sharing my desktop and uh, give it back 
uh, to Jay Han and uh, hope that we can initiate the questions. Sure. Um, we'll give you guys a couple minutes to uh, post questions. But first, I wanted to share um, that ASA has a campaign right now, um, which is to make President Trump formally declare the opioid crisis a national emergency. And Debbie will be putting a link to that in the chat box. So if you uh, would like to the president to uh, declare that this is a crisis and we need to address it, uh, take part in our End Pain, Not Lives campaign. Um, and uh, one or two other things I'd like to share uh, with the group. Um, one is, is that if you are a health professional, and you are interested in, in more information. Um, we have a cannabis care certification, which is for health professionals and patients and caregivers, but it's a portal to access over 22 and a half CME credits on cannabis. Um, so you can, it's all credited through Harvard University's The Answer page, and you can find out more at cannabiscarecertification.org. Uh, lastly, I'd like to invite you all to check out some future events we have coming up. Uh, September 18th and 19th, we're doing an in-person training in Philadelphia, but there will be remote access as well. And that is a two-day intensive training. We'll be actually featuring a cannabis extract and extraction safety course. It's the first time we're offering this about um, how to keep employees safe and not just the building and follow appropriate guidelines. Um, and we are also um, currently offering online training. So if you want to just take it online at your own pace, you're more than welcome to sign up uh, at uh, safeaccessnow.org slash events. And one last thing is if you're an operator, we do mock inspections. So to get you ready for your state inspection for your facility, for your phase one, two, or three license. If you're interested in that, check out safeaccessnow.org slash events. And now, on to some questions. Um, so, uh, one thing that came up was someone was asking about a little more info about the no drug interactions. Um, how, uh, they're asking for maybe a source on that. I was wondering if you could provide additional comments, uh, Ethan, on the no drug interactions with opioids and cannabis. Sure, yeah, it's a good question. Um, the main worry in this type of situation would be additive sedation. We know that uh, cannabis can be sedating and clearly the, the opioids are. In practice, uh, looking at these multiple clinical trials, particularly of Sativex, um, with the opioids, uh, and it was opioids of every type, we just didn't see any uh, particular difference um, in levels of uh, sedation between those that were getting their regular medicine um, without cannabis and those that were getting their regular medicine with cannabis. Um, so uh, additionally, we know from uh, those studies, also studies done um, by Donald Abrams at University of California, San Francisco, that there are no metabolic changes in the liver that prevent you from using uh, cannabis-based medicines with opioids. Um, so that would be a little more detail. The thing that you people should look out for, whether physicians or patients, is again this possibility of additive sedation. In practice, we don't seem to have a problem there, uh, however, but it's always good to be cautious. Great. Thank you. Um, another question has come in and someone is, it's a more general question, but can you tell us about your new areas of cannabinoid research now that you're moved out of GW uh, and to Phytex? Um, anything you can tell us about on the horizon and the pipeline? Uh, well, the, about? the mission has been very varied. It involves uh, hopefully making cannabis uh, safer and better. Um, uh, you know, with Jay Han, he mentioned the book chapter that we just published. Um, I'm really interested in how other components of cannabis interact with the cannabinoids, specifically THC. Uh, so that remains a very active uh, area of research. 
Additionally, I'm interested in uh, non-cannabis uh, approaches, particularly other herbs and dietary approaches that improve endocannabinoid system function. So that's been an area of interest um, uh, with Phytex as well. Okay. We had um, an interesting question, a follow-up to the drug-drug interaction question, which is uh, asking about effects on platelet function. So great, you know, liver enzyme problems. Um, you know, what about phytocannabinoids and their effect on other systems? Or, or okay. yeah. Well, we know they're not toxic to the platelets. Um, there have been old studies that show that cannabis smoking and THC actually make the platelets a little less sticky, which can be an advantage uh, in stroke prevention. So it's a, a change that's similar to what aspirin might be done, um, might be doing. Um, but there's no toxicity there, certainly, and this has been extensively examined over time. Okay, and so uh, we have a question from an MD. Uh, is there a way I, as a practitioner, can institute opioid reduction therapy? Um, is there a strategy you might recommend, or uh, maybe it's better to talk offline? <laughs> um, no, I, I'll answer this in general. Um, different states have different rules about who can treat such patients. So. I really need to advise caution. Uh, for example, only certain uh, physicians who <clears throat> may have been trained specifically can use Suboxone, uh, combined agonist antagonist, to treat patients with addiction. That's one example. My general advice would be that um, uh, changes be made uh, very slowly. Uh, this is always the best advice. Um, but um, it really is our experience that uh, patients get uh, a strong sense themselves of when they can make do with less of the opioids, and they often will self-taper, sometimes faster than we would have expected, um, reducing their dose or sometimes eliminating it. And this is particularly the case when we have um, chronic non-cancer pain. Um, and uh, with all the problems associated with op opioids, there's a big push now to reduce the number of prescriptions for similar conditions. Uh, so this would be really uh, an important endeavor um, in that population that might be taking high doses of opioids, which over time actually can produce more problems. They can aggravate neuropathic pain. Uh, so that kind of patient can actually improve with a dose reduction, and often that can be facilitated uh, with concomitant use of uh, cannabis. Um, but best advice is to go slowly, um, receive a lot of good feedback from the patient about how they're doing, and that can be with repeat clinic visits or follow-up telephone calls. Okay, great. Um... Uh, what, another specific question about um, naltrexone is, can cannabinoids be used with low-dose naltrexone? Is there a, some proceed with caution there? Um, anything you would want to comment about? Um, first, let me explain. Naltrexone is a long-acting opioid antagonist. So if someone's on naltrexone, um, basically it blocks the effects of morphine or heroin. Um, and it's sometimes used as a um, way of helping people to um, not take uh, opioids. Um, I am not aware, again, of any drug-drug interactions that would prevent this. Um, it may be the case of using two very different agents that are hoping to do the same thing, in other words, uh, help reduce uh, dependency on opioids. Um, but uh, no, there's no contraindication to using these drugs together. Hmm. Very, uh, very interesting. Um, I have a question here about administration forms. Can you comment a little bit about 
are there administration forms that have advantages if someone's treating opioids, especially if you're trying to, you know, get a good amount of CBD and THC in there? Right. Uh, if you could, yeah. Almost certainly, this is a, a situation of a chronic uh, need for medication, and under those conditions, uh, the best approaches are definitely going to be oral administration or oral mucosal administration, like sublingual administration. This would not generally be a, a, a situation where we would be recommending multiple doses a day of inhalation, particularly not smoking. Um, I'm not a proponent of smoking um, cannabis as a um, method of uh, chronic uh, use. Uh, better is uh, less, fewer problems are associated with vaporization, but even then, um, because of the rapid onset and the quick offset, um, what we really uh, would prefer is oral or oral mucosal administration, where often the patient can dose two or three times a day and uh, get the best effects. Great. Um, you know, you had you mentioned the work by Reinman and Philippe Lucas. Are there any things uh, patients should be maybe keeping track of if they're starting to use cannabis for the first time? I'm guessing uh, this is in reference to like keeping a journal about products and if they are on other prescription drugs. Are there maybe some things you think they should? <laughs> Uh, jot down that would be useful and informative? Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, very good if a uh, patient documents uh, their use patterns, and this can be great um, in working with their health care team in uh, documenting uh, what happens. It may be instructive not only to them, uh, but to their physicians. Uh, could help them in dealing with the next patient that is experiencing a similar situation. And, and would you uh, could you throw out like a conceptual question or two that a patient might want to ask themselves or um, well first thing is um, daily uh, numerical uh, rating scales of their pain so as we discussed in relation to the clinical studies um, what what is my average daily pain often this is best done in the evening before going to bed uh, so on a scale of one to 10, what was my average pain score today? And they might want to uh, also record what was the worst pain that I had during the day because they might've had a spike of pain. So monitoring those two things on a scale of one to 10, also they might want to monitor their sleep. Almost universally, when patients use cannabis, they have such a reduction in their underlying symptoms that their sleep improves. So that's another thing they could rate. Uh, furthermore, they could rate their uh, level of constipation. Any side effect that might be associated uh, with opioids, such as sedation, could be monitored as well. Um, so just be having them think in, in terms of, am I better with respect to pain, spikes of pain, my sleep, my level of constipation, my uh, sedation and my ability to function. The other thing would be, um, what can they do now that they couldn't do before? Are they able to take out the garbage to the street uh, where they couldn't before? Um, but people need to be careful too. Sometimes they feel better, they overdo, and they're gonna feel worse temporarily. Um, so all of these are things that they could monitor and report to their care team. Um, in trying to make mu mutual decisions about how to proceed. Excellent. Um, I'm not sure if I'm seeing any more questions. Um, let's see here. Uh, I guess, you know, moving forward, <laughs> something we've talked about at, at length, but what do you see as um, some of the hurdles to moving cannabis forward? as a viable treatment option for pain? Um, well, I can think of four things, but three of them are politics and one of them is ignorance. Um, so hopefully today we've done a little bit for our audience in trying to allay 
uh, ignorance by improving education about uh, this problem. Similarly, I would hope that we can educate other people out there, particularly uh, the politicians that control the other three factors. Um, I think that in this country, most of the population recognizes already um, that we have a huge problem with the opioid epidemic and that those drugs are much more dangerous than, um, than cannabis has been. Um, I'm not impugning opioid use in general. They're necessary in certain contexts, but obviously they've been overused in many contexts as well. And uh, with the associated morbidity and mortality, we need interventions and certainly cannabis seems to be one of the most promising ones. Great. Um, one last question and then uh, we'll be at our time limit. Uh, but a uh, panelist has requested to discuss more policy changes uh, that need to be made, such as paying contracts, worker comp rules, things like that. Is there anything else you could add? Um, no, I mean, we've got a strange situation in this uh, country in that many pain clinics, uh, they do uh, drug screening and um, it may be that if someone tests positively for uh, THC metabolites that uh, they won't be treated. Obviously, that approach is counterproductive. And when I speak to physician groups about pain, I always indicate this. I hope that uh, our discussion today would uh, indicate why um, that approach of uh, not allowing patients who have cannabinoid uh, metabolites in their system, uh, not allowing them uh, chronic pain treatment uh, is a bad policy and hopefully will change. Uh, agreed. Um, I guess lastly, uh, last question, uh, someone was inquiring if there's any med medical education groups who are promoting the incorporation of therapeutic aspects of cannabinoids in medical education. I think there's a couple of groups that could fall into this category, the answer page, cannabis care certification, uh, the societies that we've mentioned before that you belong to. Um, are there any other groups you think people should be involved with or, or looking for? Um, um, yeah, there is. Uh, Amanda Ryman uh, has, uh, is the director of a, uh, an addiction treatment center, I believe, in Los Angeles that now incorporates cannabis into their treatment program. Obviously, it's not a 12-step program. Um, you know, I, I hope that uh, they'll be able to publish results of uh, their work uh, soon, and hopefully this would be something that uh, people will, will give greater consideration in the future. All right, excellent. Um, uh, so with that, unless, Ethan, you have any final statements at the moment, I just uh, thank people for uh, joining with us today, and I hope that uh, this has been helpful to you. Excellent. Um, yes, yeah, so many people have said that this is an excellent webinar. webinar. For example, Pam Tarlow has uh, to quote her. Um, if you would like to follow up about the webinar, uh, you can send an email to debbie at safeaccessnow.org or to myself, jahan at safeaccessnow.org. Uh, we will be... Um, making sure that this is of good quality and be making it available on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Um, thank you all for attending. This has been one of the best webinars I think that ASA has ever uh, put on. And I look forward to seeing you all in a couple weeks when we uh, bring another fabulous guest on for an ASA webinar. All right, folks out there in internet land, have a good night. Thank you so much for attending.